Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Patrick Bavaro. I'm the Vice President of Business Development here at the Hands Heavy Company. Um, on the call with us today, you'll see we have quite a few panelists with us. Uh, Hillary Gates, uh, Peter Antevi, Dr. Mark Peel, James DiClemente, and myself. But I wanted to introduce a great friend and colleague of mine. Her name is Hillary Gates. Uh, Hillary is the Senior Editorial and Program Director at EMS World. I've known Hillary for years from her time working at the City of Alexandria Fire there in Virginia. And so I wanted to pass it over to Hillary now to uh, uh, say hello to everybody and uh, get us going with today's session. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, just a clarification, recently departed from EMS World, but yes, that's uh, where uh, Patrick and I forged a <laughs> fabulous relationship. <laughs> no problem. Folks, I'm honored today to be able to introduce two of my really good friends, Mark Peel and Peter Antevi. You are really in for a treat. These are two physicians who are what I think of as titans of our industry, and they live and breathe their missions every single day, which is really important. Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at WakeMed in Raleigh, North Carolina. He is the assistant medical director with WakeMed Mobile Critical Care Transport, and he served recently as medical director of the WakeMed Children's Hospital and director of pediatrics at WakeMed Physician Practices. Mark has faculty appointments in the departments of pediatrics at the University of North Carolina and Duke University. He is founder of the Samaritan Health Center, a clinic for homeless and uninsured patients. And he's also founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical Innovation, a company focused on improving resuscitation in shock and in sepsis. Peter is a pediatric emergency medicine physician, an EMS physician, and he is C CMO and founder of Handheavy, a pediatric system to help treat critical patients on scene quickly, effectively, and with confidence. He serves as the medical director for a number of agencies in Florida, Davie Fire Rescue, Coral Springs Parkland Fire Rescue, Southwest Ranches Fire Rescue, and he is associate medical director for Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. Peter is also a member and the lead pediatric EMS specialist for the highly influential Metropolitan EMS Medical Directors Coalition, also known as the Eagles. Mark and Peter are truly affecting change in our practice to positively impact patient outcomes. And I don't think either ever intended to start a business and be entrepreneurs, but they are both to be commended for walking the walk instead of merely sitting back and disagreeing with the status quo from afar. Make sure you check out Peter's article that was recently published in EMS World about pediatric resuscitation, which includes a thoughtful response from the AHA. To set up this webinar, it's important that we all think about EMS as its own beast and sort of a subspecialty. When it comes to treating patients, EMS really is a different animal. We see patients with different presentations than we do um, in other uh, scenarios like the hospital. They have different signs and symptoms than say an ICU clinician might see. And all of us as we're watching today should keep this in mind. As you listen to these two docs present the science and the research, be sure to evaluate the information for yourself, be informed, and make a fully informed decision to do what is right for our kids. Peter and Mark, I'll hand it over to you. Wow, Hillary, thank you so much. Thanks, Patrick, thank you very, very much. Uh, Hillary, you've been, in my opinion, a titan. You've allowed us to express our voices in a society where sometimes those expressions are not welcomed, and uh, we thank you greatly and we wish you success in all your future endeavors. So thank you so much, Olivia. Pleasure, have fun you guys. Thank you. And I know you're gonna give a lecture right now, so thanks for coming in and, and, <laughs> and pop, popping in. You're the best. Uh, good luck with that. And uh, Mark, welcome. Thanks, Peter. How, how are you doing, bud? I'm great. I'm great, awesome. thanks well, for inviting me. Oh, uh, absolutely. Well, you know, Hillary talked about, you know, the gamut of pre-hospital into the emergency department, into the ICU. And one of the biggest reasons that, uh, you know, you and I connect so well is because we cover that gamut. We see all three phases of that, and we clearly understand that they're, they're not the same, right? And so um, I wanted to just start off by explaining to everybody that, first of all, thank you guys for joining today. And we're going to present you the science. We're going to present you what's really under the hood. 
And just like Hillary said, we would like you to listen, digest, and then we'll give you all the resources you need, all the papers we talk about, anything that you need, but please go back and then do your own investigation, make your own decisions. Uh, we're not here to prescribe anything or to force anything upon you. The folks who have written these guidelines are you know, true titans. They put the hard work in, they meet frequently, they do the writing. Let's not diminish what they've done. You know, Mark and I know many of the people who are involved with this, but I think that we still have the ability to have that back and forth when we think that there are some things that have to be looked at and discussed. So um, let's start, Mark, if you don't mind, we'll start with our disclosures. Yep. And, and so I'll start by saying you heard that I'm, you know, I found that Hentevi, you're not going to hear about Hentevi today. And Mark? Same. I'm founder uh, and CMO of 410 Medical, but we won't be discussing either of our uh, relationships there on this talk. Awesome. Okay. All right, let's get started. First, uh, you all see uh, James D. Clemente, you see his photo there. Um, he's another person who just, it's been incredibly great. We've been incredibly grateful to know and to, uh, to get to know and to collaborate with. Uh, many of you now know Prodigy EMS from the Refresh 2021. They've hosted it for free. And I called James a few weeks ago and I said, hey, a lot of people asking for CEUs. He said, no problem. And thanks to James and Prodigy, all of you today will get one and a half CEUs for joining us today. We greatly appreciate that. And James, we appreciate you and your team. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's, let's start with this, which is why are kids so scary? Actually, Mark, this is your neck of the woods. This is Wake EMS. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. And just a disclaimer, I, I can't claim to be the EMS expert that Peter is or that other folks on this call are, but I have a great interest in what happens out in the field, love teaching pre-hospital professionals. Um, I, I have the almost unfair position of being able to be in a ICU in an ER with lots of resources and a lot of people around me and certainly take care of a lot of kids that are brought in by our EMS folks and friends and respect what you guys do with less resources and less help out there in the field um, every day. And so I've taken an interest in trying to help um, disseminate some of what I'm learning, what I've continued to learn about the care of critically ill kids in the hospital out to folks who are the first folks to encounter many of these children in the field. So the question is, why do kids scare us? And that's, I don't, I don't say just EMS professionals, all of us sometimes are confronted with a critically ill kid and they can be scary, but in EMS in particular, why do they? Because it's, it's seldom, seldom it's, a, it's an infrequent encounter. So less than 10% of all pre-hospital pre encounters are uh, what you guys see out in the field. And you are then confronted with high risk and low frequency conditions like cardiac arrest or uh, airway compromise. In one survey that was done about 10 years ago, um, less than a third of providers surveyed said they felt comfortable with kids and even fewer in particular felt comfortable with medication dosing. So opportunities for improvement there in the way we educate um, folks who take care of kids out in the field. Awesome. Yeah, and Mark, um, you know, I know you're not giving yourself enough credit there, but I know that you, you are, if, if there's any ICU doctor in the world uh, or, you know, someone in the ER to have at the bedside, it would be you. And I think that what you've done in the field um, with, with the pre-hospital folks and the education you've given throughout the years has been phenomenal. So Thanks. thank you very much. So let, let's, let's start off with kind of like the initial slide to kind of talk about the, the highlights we're going to be talking about today that matter. And they matter to all of us who treat kids initially, uh, who treat kids right where we find them in the pool side, uh, in the living room, um, in a, you know, let's say a massive motor vehicle accident with severe trauma. There are some guidelines that came out in October in circulation. I know many of you have read it or read about it. And this is really what we're highlighting today. And instead of just showing you the actual recommendation, we're gonna go into a deeper dive so that you understand how these recommendations came about and then make a decision on your end at your agency with your chiefs, with your medical director or at your hospital on what to do next. So let's start with the first. This was the big one. The ventilation rate was for everyone 10 breaths per minute, one breath every six seconds in cardiac arrest across the board. We know that. In 2020 in October, they came out with something that said, we're gonna increase that from 10 
to 20 to 30 breaths per minute. And uh, of course, now all the PALS teachings are going to be moving towards that. But I think it's worth to pause, to look into where that data came from, what data do we have to lean on from the past, and then make an educated decision as to how to move forward. So that's number one. Number two, symptomatic bradycardia, as, as many of you know, is the only protocol that differentiates PALS from ACLS. And when I say only, I mean, when I'm talking about the algorithm, where in the algorithm for kids, if a child has symptomatic bradycardia, meaning you're doing chest compressions, they're altered and they have a low heart rate, they want you to give a cardiac arrest dose of epinephrine, right? Um, whereas in the adult population, it's never been the case there was an opportunity for them to change it this time around and they didn't. And that's the second item we're gonna be talking about today. Thirdly, in 2015, uh, there, was a, there was a recommendation that uh, caused a lot of people to call me. And because the recommendation said, uh, consider strongly if you, if you wanna give fluids to a child in shock, meaning that think about it before you do it. And um, I thought that was inappropriate. And in 2015, uh, I was very vocal about it. And now, only now in 2015, has the task force agreed to reevaluate what, what they said in 2015. And here we are now six years later, and they're thinking about making a change. And they will, and they should. And Mark will talk a lot about that since he's really the expert on fluids. Number four, using cuffed ET tubes. That's been around for a while. We're we're going to talk about intubation in children. We'll talk about the cuff tube as well. So we'll, we'll make sure we focus on that for a few minutes. But then also, this is the first time the guidelines talk about hemorrhagic shock and actually giving blood. However, they talk about giving component therapy. Give the red cells, give the FFP, give the platelets, um, and, and basically give all those in, th in three separate components. Whereas as many of you know, in EMS, we're using whole blood and we think that's the future. So let's start and get into this and we'll go through one by one. We'll take a deep dive into the science. And then as we're going through, if you have questions, comments, we, you know, listen, we want to learn. We want to be better. We are not committed to saying we're doing this no matter what. If there's evidence to the contrary, we will be the first people to raise our hands and say, we understand now. But you'll see that in some of these, we don't think the evidence is there just yet. Mark, go ahead. All right. So um, I said, why are we scared of kids in the pre-hospital uh, environment? And the quest second question is, well, why should we care? Why should we expend resources uh, in sometimes resource-constrained world of EMS on improving the way we care for kids? And I'll give you a, a few data points that highlight it, other than it's just the right thing to do. So um, the biggest killer of kids in the US is trauma. And one child dies every hour of some type of injury in the US. So not only is trauma the most important killer of kids, it kills more kids than all other diagnoses combined. So it's something that we ought to focus on intensely. Um, a, a cardiac arrest in children occurs out of hospital over once per hour. So it's while it may not be a high frequency event for your own agency, it's high frequency in our nation. And EMS professionals are most often the first point of contact with either of these types of uh, illness, illnesses or injuries. And we know that better pre-hospital care saves lives. There's a massive opportunity in both of these conditions for EMS uh, providers to improve outcomes and save kids' lives. Um, it, it's, uh, Sad that around 10% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients survived a discharge. We'll show you some data from an agency where they've been able to drastically improve upon that number. And it's probably true that more time on scene providing the correct interventions improves survival rather than a pure scoop and run approach. So that's just setting up the question, why, why does this whole topic matter to us um, in the pre-hospital world? Right. And, and Mark, I agree with you. And really, that's why the AHA exists, right? The whole purpose is to make those numbers better, to improve yep. outcomes, to make lives better. And really that's why we exist. And that's why everyone who's watching exists. We are the front line to make this happen. So 
I wanted to kind of expand on what Mark was just saying. And, you know, this, this comes right out of the guidelines from 2020, that there's 20,000 pediatric arrests per year, 7,000 of which are out of hospital. But look at that pie chart. 11.4% survive to discharge. However, only half of those, and it comes up to about 5.3%, have a favorable neurologic outcome, meaning that they're running around playing soccer still. These numbers haven't changed for decades, right? Not last year and five years ago. These out of hospital, and you can see, this is the graphic that I, I kind of keep with me in my brain all the time. That blue line there is really the favorable neurologic outcome curve for children since the 80s. Look at the red line, in hospital has done much better, but out of hospital, we haven't done better. And this also shows that the children who are having an arrest in the hospital and those having an arrest out of the hospital are not the same, two different populations. And we're gonna talk about that here in a minute. I wanted to kind of show you this because as we go through the guidelines, there is a strength and quality of evidence. Now the writing is small. You see, I have to have reading glasses on, so I'm gonna make it a little bigger here, okay? On the left-hand side, this is just kind of a, a table showing how do we qualify or, you know, or, or quantify the evidence that we're reading. You can see that on the left-hand side is the strength of the evidence and it goes one, two A or two B. Once you're into three, you're in no benefit. And then uh, there's class three harm. Now the best evidence of strength is on the left is a class one. Now what about the quality of evidence? That looks at what type of studies have been done and you can see that the level A, those are the RCTs, the randomized controlled trials. So having a 1A is like the Bible, it's the law, and we all would agree to it. Then you go to B, randomized. Then you go to B, non-random. Then you go to level C, which is limited data, or level C, expert opinion. So as you're going through these guidelines, you'll start to see a lot of 2Bs, a lot of level Cs. So weak strength, limited or expert opinion on the quality. So we are gonna point that out as we go along. But as an example, can any of you guess how many 1A recommendations are in the PALS guidelines altogether? Just kind of keep that number in your mind. And um, I only need one quarter of a slide because there's only one <laughs> and it's here. The only 1A recommendation that exists is after, it is basically saying, the continuous measurement of core temperature during targeted temperature management, which Mark does in his ICU, um, is a 1A. Basically, make sure you manage, you monitor the temperature. Let me give you another example to show you where some other ones fit in, because this is a good example. This is a 2B level C expert opinion, which, me, which says that if you have, um, if, if the manual defibrillator or the AED doesn't have a pediatric attenuator, use the AED like an adult AED on the kid. And we've known that, but the data behind it you could see is weak and the quality is only expert opinion. Keep that in mind as we're going through and we'll keep reiterating this because if someone came and said, hey, this is a 1A, most of us would not go against that. So let's continue on. I'm gonna start with the ventilation question and we're gonna start to take a deeper dive now into the science. First, let's start with the actual guidelines and what they said. It's part four. This is Circulation 2020, published in October. And here it is. A respiratory rate of 20 to 30 breaths per minute is new for infants and children who are receiving CPR with an advanced airway in place or receiving rescue breathing and have a pulse. So this is, uh, you know, that's that class of patients. And just to show it to you in a different mechanism, here we are. It's a 2B week, uh, quality C, limited data, right? So just understand where that is fitting in. And we're gonna talk about this actual strength and quality of evidence, and then you decide. Because when something fits as a 2B CLD, that's something that then you have to go in and say, okay, now what am I gonna do? What is Peter and Teddy gonna do here at, in South Florida? Or if you're a physician, what are you gonna do? So that's, that's, uh, that's important to know. I'm gonna show you a quick video here because when we're talking ventilations, don't just think, think the lung in a silo. The lung is connected by other ways, whether you like it or not, 
to two other major organs. And so take a look at this very quick, maybe five second video to show how the lung, when it inflates and why the importance of those two big breaths early gets the blood flow moving, but then we wanna make sure that we don't cause harm by overdoing it. Let's take a look. You can see that we do two big breaths on every patient when we arrive to the scene. That opens that lung bed, the blood can start flowing through and now it's all about flow. So let's take a look at the flow that I'm talking about here. The flow we're talking about is related to the positive pressure that you're adding into the thorax, right? The body doesn't like positive pressure, but we have no choice. And so now when we add positive pressure, we're now causing an issue for the heart that preload suffers and then therefore the LV ejection uh, suffers. But here's one that I think has been missed by many people which is the venous return. When that thorax pressure is high, blood cannot return. And the one place that maybe people have forgotten about is the brain. If the blood cannot return from the brain, then you cannot eject it to the other side into the brain. And therefore you have stasis. You do not have a good flow from that CPR that you're giving. And it's related to the amount of pressure that you're adding to the chest. Um, a major, major thing, and that's why there's some big people in the field now who are talking about heads up CPR, and I was involved in a big pre-hospital study on that, that showed great benefit. Why? Because the gravity pulled the blood from the brain into the chest, and that was a big, big thing. So positive pressure is not good for the heart, it's not good for the brain, and it's not good for flow in general, but it is good for oxygenation. So if you keep bagging somebody, their PO2 will go up at the expense of the flow uh, from the heart, the brain, and the lungs. I wanna go back into the history of books a little bit and to really highlight these two gentlemen, Keith Lurie and Tom Ofter Heidi. Uh, th these two, in my opinion, are the, ti the real titans. Uh, they do many, you know, many of the papers that we read uh, on resuscitation uh, have their names on them. What did they do that helped us make the change to the guidelines years ago to 10 breaths per minute? They did a study on pig and look at the name of the study, death by hyperventilation, a common and life-threatening problem during CPR. And what they did was they studied pigs. This is important. They had a group of pigs where they actually breathed them at 12 breaths per minute, everything else being equal. And another group of pigs that they breathed at 30 breaths per minute. Look at the survival here. Uh, what a tremendous difference the only difference was the change in ventilation. And so what came out of the study was, and again, I don't think they had exactly the, the, the full reasons here. And now that we know the full reasons are for the flow, but take a look at the, the survival and now take a look at the data from within the paper. At the top, cerebral perfusion pressure. Those pigs who were, who were breathed at 12, you could see that they had a higher cerebral perfusion pressure. And yes, it wasn't a significant value, but it was approaching significance. And we know this now to be true from their subsequent cadaver studies. And, and again, here is that ventilation rate. And you can see here a significant difference in survival. So this is where that data initially came from. So there are no studies on children. There are no studies on children looking at ventilation rates. And this is where we now end up here in 2020 with a change. So let's take a look at the data that changed the guidelines. And then I'm gonna pop it over to uh, Mark here in a minute, but I wanna start, um, and then I'm, I'm gonna get Mark's opinion on this one, because this, this is the study. Ventilation rates in pediatric in-hospital cardiac arrest survival outcomes. Uh, Mark, can you, can you start us off by talking about, you know, th there's some big names on this study and talk about the collaborative network that actually made this study happen. Yeah, so I think this was from something called the CAPCORN Network, which is a big pediatric critical care research group made up of many um, respected researchers who, for whom I have respect as well, who will have produced much more important science than I ever, I ever will. This is a disclaimer. This is, this is good research conducted by people who are good at it and it's produced important results. The question is, is it applicable to us in the pre-hospital or even ED environment? That, that will be the main question. And as you note the patients who were enrolled, they were all ICU patients. And not only were they all patients in the ICU, but they all had already in place an endotracheal tube, an end tidal CO2 monitor, 
and most of them had invasive monitoring like A lines or central lines, and most of them had vasoactive infusions already going. So not a pop important study, brilliantly done, but maybe not the population or definitely not the population that we're seeing in the field uh, with cardiac arrest. Awesome. And so Mark, I'm going to, I'm going to point the audience here to some numbers that we're going to dive into a little bit more in the next slide here, but it looks like on this study, there was only 47 children. Uh, this is an observational study and there were 18 children of the 47 who survived to discharge. Can you talk about the differences in a PICU versus a cardiac ICU just for a moment so people understand the types of patients we're dealing yeah, with? Yeah, and it's not, I, I think a lot of these did have congenital heart disease, Peter. So that's maybe not as important a distinction because in many hospitals, those two are not distinct ICUs. So there may have nevertheless been a good number of post-operative cardiac patients in the, in the unit here that's called PICU. So I, I don't know that I can specifically comment on that other than these are critically ill patients with invasive monitoring who have most likely either have congenital heart disease or have recently undergone surgery. So it's, it's, a, it's a very sick, complex population. Right, and actually on the next slide, I do have the exact patient population. And so I, I just want everyone to remember here that, of, that there are 18 survivors. We're gonna take a look on uh, one of the next slides here. 17 of them belong to one specific category. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay. This is, this is um, another important slide. The pre-existing conditions of the patients enrolled in this study to the tune of 60% of them had congenital heart disease. So again, the patient population we're talking about, they're intubated, they have A-lines, their fluids are maximized, and now they have congenital heart disease. So just remember that information. Moving onward, let's take a look at what was the presenting rhythm for these patients and how did they do based on their presenting rhythm? And th this, this is an important uh, table for everyone to know. Let's take a look at the bottom. 74% of the patients in this study presented in their cardiac arrest with bradycardia or poor perfusion, 17 of which ended up surviving to hospital discharge. So Let's consider the type of patients we see in EMS, and those are typically asystole PEA. And you can see here that did any of those patients survive in this study? None of them did. So please understand as you're investigating in your mind and, and learning this study, to understand the patient population does not compare at all to what we see in the field. And I think that's an important distinction. Mark, did you have any other comments on that? Yeah, the only th other thing I wanted to mention uh, Peter, is that at the time the guidelines were 10 breaths per minute in cardiac arrest. And in no patient, I believe in the study, was that even achieved. Just showing that it's hard to do, it's hard to slow down and give a reasonable number of breaths and not overventilate, assuming these patients were not overventilated. Even in an ICU staffed with a lot of uh, highly skilled people. And so the, I think the average breath rate was around in the 30s in most of these kids. So so, that so, was difficult. so Mark, you're, you're, an, you're an intensivist, right? At a, at a great hospital. Why is that? How is it possible that the best of the best couldn't get to 10 breaths per minute? You know, in some of them, it might have been um, that they were targeting a, a, def a defined entitled CO2. So I can't comment on that. But as we all know, cardiac arrest situations are anxiety provoking and, and we do things that in retrospect, we think we should have done differently. And that applies whether you are two paramedics in the field by yourselves or a room full of four doctors and 10 nurses and respiratory therapists and, and others. It's, it's um, you know, we like to think that we do it calmly and expertly, but there is always a degree of anxiety mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. intensity that goes along with it. And so we may not adhere to some of the uh, practices that we actually preach when we're not in that situation. I couldn't agree with you more. When we see QI, our runs in, in my system, uh, you know, we use code stat. Um, we, we see it very clearly that unless there's some way of letting someone know to breathe at that specific time, right. you, you end up going along with the, your chest compressor or with your own kind of heart rate or, or something else. But, um, and, and that goes back to 
Keith Lurie and Tom Afterhardy's paper showing that, you know, death by hyperventilation. Now, what you mentioned about going along with the end tidal CO2, that's a different story. Uh, and I, I agree with you that, that that should be perhaps what should we be using, but it, it shouldn't just be a flat rate. So let, let's, let's go here and basically put on here again, the 2B CLD. Now you understand why it got that designation because you had an observational study of 47 patients. And the, the other point to, to, to drive home here is, you know, perhaps there should be a different set of uh, considerations for in-hospital rest versus what we do in the field, which is very, very different. The patient population, the setting, um, really a lot of what we do is, is different. Now, I want everyone to, to, to know one thing. At the same moment that PALS gets published in the same journal, circulation, October, 2020, the international group, which is called ILCOR, which is International Consensus on Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation, they also publish theirs, which is basically what the rest of the world decides to do. And let's take a look what they, what they wrote specifically about this one guideline change. They said, we're gonna stay at 10 breaths per minute because it was small, it was a single center observational paper. And they said they need to await more evidence in order to make their decision. So kudos to them uh, for doing that. And before we go off here and, and, and go into some other airway things, um, you know, I'll make it known here that this is my intention, just me personally, to do that is to stay with the 10 breaths per minute until there's more convincing evidence uh, to the contrary. So uh, Mark, th this is an area that you put a lot of work into, which is the basics, right? Just right. BVM or end tidal, so, or, sorry, or endotracheal tube. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so um, I think if bag valve mass ventilation is now considered reasonable compared to advanced airway, meaning it's as good as, if not better, um, based on the data that are available, we should be asking, do we even provide that therapy correctly? Okay, so in the study you just mentioned, everyone had an endotracheal tube. It's a different, uh, it's a different story. But most of the time when we first encounter a patient uh, in the pre-hospital environment, often in the ED and sometimes in the hospital, we are first providing ventilations with a bag valve mask. And it's my observation um, over many years that we don't do that very well. So let's look at a, a bit of the data on, that have informed whether we put in an advanced airway or use bag valve mask in the field. And the, and the, the commonly cited classic study um, is from a group of docs out in LA, Marianne Gaucher Hill and others from the year 2000, where they said, should we be intubating these patients? Okay, so the cardiac arrest study we just looked at, they already had tubes in in the field, what should we do? And this will, let me just preface this by saying, this will be a controversy that will outlive either of us, okay? <laughs> I don't know that this question will ever be settled. And Peter and I both have some strong opinions on, on it and we'll present you a little of the data. But um, this study quickly to review was conducted over three years with almost a thousand patients out in LA in Orange County and the paramedics there received two fairly extensive airway education sessions prior to the implementation of this protocol. And then patients were randomized to get BVM only or to receive an endotracheal tube. And they had a low success rate in their intubations. They had a higher success rate with BVM, which was as assessed by a chest rise. That's the only marker of whether they were BVMing well or not. And in the patients who were intubated, uh, many of them had esophageal intubations or tube dislodgement en route. All of them died. And the conclusion was that there's no difference in outcome and an endotracheal tube does not add to our therapies in the field. So there's a few buts that we should consider on the next slide. Um, this is the conclusion, let's don't intubate kids in the field. And that's become um, fairly standard, I think, practice in many agencies. It's based on this, we're not gonna place an advanced airway or at least an endotracheal tube. So the buts are, it's not clear to me um, how BVM technique was taught and whether it was taught correctly. And my observation, even to this day, is we don't do it very well. We don't provide good ventilations with a mask alone. And there's some ways to improve upon that. And I'll try to show you those. 
Um, it was before the routine use of entitled CO2. It was certainly before the use of superglottic airways. We are not sure exactly how the people were trained in um, endotracheal intubation, but we know that they didn't have video, which I believe is what we should be using in every intubation, every time, whether hospital or pre-hospital. Um, a standard direct laryngoscopy blade, in my opinion, is not, um, is, it, it's old school and we should advance to the technology that we have available, which is video laryngoscopy. And uh, it was also before the use of ketamine for um, induction. Although in, in cardiac arrest, obviously we're not using induction meds. So, so, so basically, Mark, this is, um, it, was, it was a good study at the time, but here we are 21 years later. Yep. And we, we, we still have work to do on the basic techniques, but we do have other tools in the toolbox, other, other pieces of equipment, um, and other medications, correct? Yep. And Peter, well, and, how would you say this, this data still influences uh, decisions on protocols today? Well, listen, I mean, I'm, I'm in contact with many people around the country, and um, people do lean on this study very heavily. Um, and, you know, what, what was interesting, and again, you know, we all think the world of uh, Dr. Gachet Hill and all the other folks on this, uh, on this study, but it, 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 is it possible, Mark, that a, uh, a paramedic had one of the three hour sessions on, on year one and perhaps didn't intubate mm -hmm. until year three of the study. Yes. Correct. And then the, the way that they quantified good BVM, which was just with chest rise, and then without all of these other tools that we have today, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that's what you're saying. And I think that's really the importance of why we're just bringing this information up again, because if you're gonna make a decision, you should make it understanding why it happened and not just to take it for face value. Yeah, and I think it's agency dependent and where you have the ability to train uh -huh. um, routinely in simulation and even in an OR setting, which I know is difficult with actual back valve and mass ventilation and intubation, I think it makes sense for paramedics to be able to place advanced airways. Um, and I am more and more impressed with the utility of superglottics, which I know you use in your agency, yes. Peter. First line. So yep. let's, look, let's think about this. Why might it cause harm for us to place an advanced airway? And by the way, this applies just as much in the ED and the ICU as it does in the pre-hospital world. Number one is we probably get distracted with the priority of placing an airway. So interrupting compressions is probably a bad thing. There are some new data that suggests maybe in some cases this isn't as much of a factor as we have thought, but I believe it's still meaningful. That as we um, perform good high quality CPR, we establish a perfusion pressure to the brain, the coronaries, the organs that with interruption descends to zero and then has to be elevated again by a subsequent good number of compressions. And so as we interrupt compressions to uh, place any airway, but particularly to provide an intubation, we may then be harming the perfusion to the brain. And I think that's a valid and worthy of, of, of consideration every time you're in one of these situations. So in, 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 when I'm involved in one of these situations in the ER or the trauma room, I'm often saying we are not stopping compressions to establish the airway. And we will place that tube with a video laryngoscope while compressions are going on because I feel strongly about this da these data. Number two, there's certainly a risk of failed ET2 placement as we saw in the study. We probably delay other interventions as we spend a lot of time with uh, placing an endotracheal tube. The uh, potentially most uh, expert provider in the room is the one tasked with placing that airway and maybe distracted from other important things, access, meds, defibrillation, whatever it might be. And then, as we've just talked about, Peter, the risk of hyperventilation as we, in kind of a hyped up state, may overventilate with pressure and or rate and paradoxically um, diminish our cerebral perfusion. So I think there's a lot of reason why we should be very careful about thinking everyone needs an endotracheal tube. And so I think your move to um, superglottic airways first is probably a, a good one. And, and Mark, I mean, this is a great and this is an important graphic for people to see. I will say that my years in EMS, and I'm, I'm only 11 years in, what I've learned is, is that is the chest compression quality um, and the full recoil, because the full recoil is when the coronaries are getting perfused. It's when that's how we're going to get ROSC. And oftentimes people are so focused on that airway, even when EMS comes in and there's a superglottic, there's a great end title and the sats are fine. 
we rip it out in the emergency department. And then we all focus on the airway. And then someone is doing chest compressions like on, on a stool because, you know, again, we don't work on the ground, unfortunately, in the emergency department. And the, the quality of chest compressions goes down on top of these uh, delays that you just talked about here. So um, it's really the basics. Peter, I know we, we don't have time to take in a ton of questions, but there's one right here coming in about uh, comments on asynchronous ventilation to compression ratio in kids. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, the, remember that if you're going to be 15, 15 to 2, that's 15 to 2. But when, once you go asynchronously, uh, that's what we just described. It's one breath every six seconds or 10 breaths per minute. We're going to go into more detail. Remember, PALS want you to do now 20 to 30 um, you know, breaths per minute. And there are some other people who are now going the other way. So one, once you hit that supraglottic airway, then you automatically now in the asynchronous uh, realm. And it doesn't matter what that chest compressor is doing because they're going continuously. And you're just going to be going on the upstroke um, every six seconds for 10 breaths per minute. Uh, and that's, again, that's my agency today. All right. And lastly, Peter, I just didn't mention the hyperoxia, but we, we, we are, we tend to forget that too much oxygen is bad for the brain as well. And so if we are supplying our BVM or, um, or our BVM with 100% oxygen, there's a risk that with an endotracheal tube, we may overdo that oxygenation. And credit to the guidelines, because they actually talk about that. Yeah. And they, again, it's, it's still a 2B and a C uh, recommendation, but it's, it's actually in there. And um, we, we've added that to our protocols in EMS as well. So I, I greatly agree with that. All right, so on the other hand, quickly, and I know we're veering off a little bit of these uh, PALS guidelines, but I think this is an important topic. So why might it be important to place an advanced airway? And by that, I mean an endotracheal tube or a supraglottic like a King or LMA or IGEL. So what's the most common cause of cardiac arrest in the field? It's gonna be asphyxia hypoxia. And so just like with a myocardial infarction in an adult, they need that coronary artery opened up again to sustain their uh, myocardial function. And in a kid, they need, with an asphyxial arrest, they need oxygen. And so the better um, we can supply enough oxygen and enough ventilation, the, the, be the, the better we are going to get uh, a better outcome in, in ROSC if, if uh, someone has died of hypoxia. Number two, we like to use end tidal CO2 to measure the effectiveness of our compressions. And that's harder to do if not impossible to do well with a BVM with a, without a great seal. So an advanced airway in place allows us to be monitoring that end tidal CO2 for which we, can, which we can use for monitoring the effectiveness of our compressions and potentially for detecting ROSC as that end tidal CO2 bumps up. Um, controversial topic a little bit, Peter, and we can't get too much into it, but a cuffed ET tube allows us to supply a small amount of PEEP, which helps open up those collapsed alveoli, especially in an asphyxial arrest or an arrest that occurred from a pneumonia. So we don't want to overdo the PEEP, but a small amount of PEEP can actually help us improve or decrease per, uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction, and pulmonary venous uh, obstruction to flow. And I like using five or eight of PEEP on a bag valve mask when I'm ventilating these kids. Um, and then a cuffed ET tube potentially minimizes aspiration. It makes intuitive sense that it would there interestingly aren't great data that that is true, but we believe that um, it probably plays some role in minimizing subsequent aspiration after we've placed the tube. You wanna take this one, Peter? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think here is um, a great, some great take home points with respect to the airway. And, you know, I've learned a lot from you on this topic with respect to um, you know, how to open the airway, and then ultimately how to actually do a good BVM. So let, let's kind of move into that uh, section next, if you don't mind, Mark. And, yep. you know, um, I, think, I think everybody on the call understands that when you have a younger child, the airway um, it, it will, will suffer if you do not put a roll under the child's shoulder uh, to kind of open up that airway. But you know, Mark, you're the expert on this. You, you've actually crawled into MRI machines to show people what a jaw test looks like. So yep. take it away. So yeah, and I'm not saying I'm the expert, but I've spent some time thinking about it. And I think ultimately it was back in the day taught by an anesthesiologist that I, my bag valve mask technique was poor. And I've since that day tried to make it better. And so that I can provide an adequate uh, airway when I need to. 
Peter, if you want to zip back to that one slide for a sec, it's just a worthy, worthy of remembering that kids, especially under two, have a large occipital skull and tend to flex their head, thereby obstructing the airway much more easily than adults do. And then their tongue is big relative to the mouth. So upper airway obstruction is common in kids. And how do you overcome that? So this is an actual patient um, who was in MRI, deeply sedated on, on propofol. And you can see on the left-hand screen, uh, left hand of the screen that her tongue, while the airway is patent, her tongue is far back in the mouth. It's up against the soft palate. The epiglottis is near touching the back of the throat. And that airway is maintained, but barely. And so if you have a child then who has had a cardiac arrest or a seizure or a narcotic overdose or some other reason it's neurologically impaired, that upper airway is easily obstructed. And the best way to open it up is with a jaw thrust. So a head tilt is great but a jaw thrust, which you can see produced in the MRI scanner on the right-hand side, then draws the jaw forward, pulls the epiglottis off the back of the throat and gives you room between the palate and the tongue. It's a brilliant, simple, easy maneuver that helps us more effectively ventilate prior to placing uh, an advanced airway. And by the way, sometimes we can get a kid who's seized in this postictal and apneic or not breathing effectively through that episode, sometimes just with a BVM if we do it properly. So how do we bag right? And again, this is my opinion. Um, there's been a lot of thought put into this by other folks, uh, but I wanted to comment on the PALS EC clamp technique in which um, the, 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 the priority is on getting a good mask seal, which is important. But in doing so, if you allow your fingers to be placed under the patient's jaw, under the mandible, you do a couple things. You one, close the mouth, which could be one of your important upper airway passages. And you can press the tongue up against the roof of the mouth. This is where the anesthesiologist told me, Mark, you have poor form when you do that, when you, when you follow the PALS guidelines. And so if instead you wanna create a jaw thrust and not risk closing the mouth, you can do something which we'll see on the next screen, which is a two-hand ventilation where you are actually raising the jaw up against the mask and your thumb and forefinger are putting pressure down on the mask. That works beautifully. And in an ideal world, we'd all have one person dedicated to holding this position and another person ventilating. But the truth is, how often do we have that luxury? And so how can you do this on your own? And I find that just rotating your hand 90 degrees from the PALS uh, CE clamp recommendation to another position where my fingers are under the mandible of the jaw away from, sorry, under the angle of the mandible, away from the submental area. The C now of my, of my thumb and forefinger, the C shape actually fits over and becomes a V which fits over the mask. Go to the next one, Peter. And um, you'll see here in this, in this example, how I can get a nice easy mask airway, raise the jaw, produce a jaw thrust, produce an adequate head tilt and get a nice easy mask ventilation. By the way, this is a mannequin, not a real baby, even though it looks like one. So I'm gonna gently tilt the head, get the tongue off the back of the throat. My hands, my fingers are away from the submental area. The V of thumb and forefinger are giving me a nice mask seal and I'm giving a jaw thrust with my middle or ring finger and I get a nice easy mask ventilation. This is what we're tempted to do when we're stressed is what we, not, we shouldn't do. So that's <laughs> oh, what ineffective <laughs> ventilations, gastric insufflation, and ultimately vomiting. So learn to bag well, and you will solve a lot of problems. Awesome. Well, Mark, that, that's a great technique, and I hope everyone listening, uh, you know, at least gives that a try in your next training session and adopt that. So now we're going to go to the contrarian opinion. And many of you know that I, I you know, look up to Paul Banerjee out in Polk County. He's not a pediatric guy. But what, what they, when they looked at the literature, they said, hey, you know what? We think 10 is too, is too many per minute. We're gonna go down to six. And remember I told you that the, the outcomes in kids is 5% neurologically normal. Well, you could see, and remember it was like 11% survival to discharge. Take a look at the data from Polk County and you, you could see here what's happening every year and you know, year three, four, and five. And you could see that the uh, ROSC is in blue, the orange is admitted to hospital, the gray is survived to hospital discharge. And you could see that year after year, they're you know, 
let's say doubling and tripling what the current outcomes are for the last you know, four decades in this country. And so what, had, what has been set up here now in the United States is the following. You have people like Dr. Banerjee at six. You have people like us here in South Florida and maybe even throughout Florida staying at 10. Then other people are gonna go to 20 and 30. It's, it's gonna start to set up more clarity you know, and I guess this is the unfortunate way that's going to have to be figured out. But if people can keep their data and keep a registry, we will very soon learn the answer to who's right. I think Dr. Banerjee is correct in this scenario because, you know, all you need is a couple of breaths to oxygenate yourself. The question is, with these six breaths per minute, what is your end title? If your end title is, you know, super high, 80, 90, well, sure, you have to bring that down but you shouldn't stick at 30 breaths per minute and see your end title go all the way down. I think there is a Goldilocks zone here that is not just one single number. I think that the field and specialty of EMS, I mean, we know what we're doing in cardiac arrest. Um, and I think that the truth will be told in the next coming years. And we're surely gonna be part of that research. And just to show you the, the Polk County experience, again, they published their data in 2019, uh, February. And unfortunately, this was not included in the guidelines um, uh, review. But you can see here that when they, you know, that in 2012 and 13, and then 14, 15, 16, and 17, the survival moved up significantly. And by the way, the average time to epi, let me back up one. The average time to epi was also significantly different because they stayed on scene and they got it done quickly. So, uh, Mark, you want to talk yeah. about that real quick? Yeah, and it's hard to know exactly which components uh, yeah. of this bundle improved, dramatically improved their cardiac arrest survival, but it's fair to say that all of them played a role. And I think back to our, one of our original slides, actually paying attention and thinking, we're going to do this better was maybe the number one, right, Peter? Like just spending some time thinking, let's, let's, let's spend time on scene, get it right there and save some kids' lives. And they did that. Right. So the components were um, on-scene care immediately, uh, not uh, moving the child to another location like the vehicle, a priority of bag valve mask and, and advanced airway placement. Uh, interestingly, a question just came in or a comment just came in saying, bypass the BVM and go straight to the upper, to the superglottic. And that's actually not an unreasonable approach. I don't know, Peter, how you feel about that, but. Uh, yeah, I'll give you my comment on that. In, in that if, if you've ever done the eye gel, it, it takes some doing, right? So you yeah. have to open up the package. You have to lubricate it. We use a 12 French Salem sump, which you have to lubricate that. And so what we've done is we've added a position four, which is basically just for the eye gel. So we do have the BVM going because in a drowning, you need that oxygenation ventilation soon yeah, I agree. and you can't wait. So it buys you maybe two additional minutes of airway, but if it was a perfect world, then I would agree. But I think you, you need those couple of minutes to get yep. set up. Yep. Immediate IO access. And we'll talk about kind of our preference now for where to place that IO in kids. If you can, um, the, they obviously use the uh, hand heavy age-based dosing guides. So they were prepped ahead of time with dosing and knowledge of what they were going to do in terms of their ET tube size or superglottic size or doses of epi, they prepped on, on, in the ambulance on the way uh, to the scene and they used a defined pit crew approach through simulation training and were able to dramatically uh, improve time to epi and um, meaningful neurologically intact survival. It's a pretty cool study. Right, and, and Mark, just like you had mentioned earlier, they're all superglottic or ETI. On, on, on all of you these remember cases. remember the percentage, Peter, on those two? You know what? I don't. I don't, but um, we, can, we can get it. If people are interested, they should, yeah. they should ping us and we'll, we'll do that. And we can even connect you with Dr. Banerjee himself. Yep. Okay, great. All right. So here, here's the part that I think many people um, kind of looked at. And then there's a wide variety of what people will do. And I have to say that in 2015, um, this study came out and I, I really you know, anxiously waiting to hear what you have to say about this study, Mark, but uh, the FEAST trial was a study that was done that impacted the guidelines in 2015 that I wasn't happy with, and I was vocal about it back at the time. Um, I feel a little bit good about myself that I, I feel like now they're finally coming around and saying, 
looks like we didn't do the right thing, but they still haven't changed the guidelines. So let's just kind of take the, um, the back in time mobile and go back to 2015. And I got so many phone calls about this and it was question, should we restrict volume in shock? Let me repeat, kids in shock, hypotensive, tachycardic, should you say, no, nah, I'm not gonna give this kid fluid. And so here's the exact language, administration of an initial bolus of 20 per kilo to infants and children in shock is reasonable. Instead of saying is absolutely mandatory, they said is reasonable. And then they had some caveats here to give uh, boluses with caution if you don't have resources. And, and you, you wonder to yourself, well, why did they say that? And they recommended against boluses for children not in shock. Right. And of course, what we'd all agree with is frequent assessment. So Mark, I'm hoping that you could take us into this one study by Dr. Maitland and explain to us out of all of these studies that were done, how come she showed in one study that not giving fluids, so all of these studies here were looking at, should we restrict fluids in shock? She found one single moment where withholding fluids was beneficial yep. and they used that data to make the change to the guidelines. So I, I really wanna hear what you have to say um, about this particular guideline from 2015. So I'll go, go back to that last slide, Peter, just quickly. So another one with the chart. Um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting that based on one study, guidelines were changed or the flavor or bias of the guidelines were changed. And one reason is, to be fair, it was the only randomized control trial looking at this question. So we should, we should validate that as important. Yes. Um, and two, let me just re give a disclaimer that I have um, part of my life has been devoted to improving care around this issue. And so I have a potential conflict, which I won't, I'm not discussing anything proprietary here, but you have to understand I have a potential bias on this subject. So uh, we appreciate, we appreciate you saying that Mark, uh, but yeah, go ahead and let's, yeah. let's talk about that feast trial yeah. and, and explain maybe starting off by let's talk about children in general. Why is hypotension and yep. uh, tachycardia important? Okay. So um, I think the classic graph that I remember from even my fellowship days is this one, which is that children have an, a remarkable ability to appear compensated for shock. Shock being inadequate delivery of oxygen to the tissues, which can occur for a variety of reasons, of course. Um, sepsis being one, anaphylaxis, a uh, hundred different diseases, hemorrhage, but the children, maybe more than adults, are able to jack up their heart rate, improve their systemic vascular resistance by vasoconstriction, and maintain their cardiac output and blood pressure for a while, and maybe have uh, subtle manifestations of altered cardiac output, like poor peripheral perfusion, altered mental status, irritability, but tachycardia being the key thing. Heart rate is the most important vital sign in a kid, period. If it's really high, you need to wonder what's going on. And they have the ability to maintain that uh, until they can't, which is when they become hypotensive suddenly and have decompensated shock. So um, the opportunity to intervene occurs in this middle window where we have tachycardia, altered markers of perfusion, and pre -hypo, the pre the development of hypotension. This is where obviously we need to intervene when we have hypotension 100%, and uh, fluid bolus is the most often and important, oftenly received and important uh, intervention there. But should we be intervening early? And all of the PALS uh, guidelines and literature to date, up until these last guidelines, have said yes, we need to intervene well ahead of time before the child becomes hypotensive because once the hypotension occurs, we're at great risk of cardiovascular collapse. So yes, intervene early. Um, and what has created some hesitance around this about intervening early with fluids is this study that Peter mentioned, okay. And I think it, this will be a little bit detailed, but it is really worthy of everyone understanding because it has informed the approach to fluid resuscitation uh, in many, many guidelines and is also cited by a lot of the adult literature on fluid resuscitation and sepsis. So this was a study well done, um, well-funded, lots of great researchers involved with it. 
uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa in children with something called severe febrile illness. To be clear, this was not a sepsis study. It's often quoted as a sepsis study. It wasn't. And they took children who uh, uh, appeared to a, a healthcare facility with impaired perfusion. So uh, prostration was the word they used, uh, altered cap refill, tachycardia, and randomized them to 20 per kilo of fluid over an hour. Um, later in the study, I think they gave up to 40 in, in a later iteration. Yeah, and then it was repeated if they were not improved after that hour. And they showed that in the fluid bolus group, there was higher mortality, 10% versus 7%. And on this basis, uh, understandably, because it's a randomized controlled trial, people have been, begun to question, is fluid bolus therapy safe in children? And so just like with the other study we mentioned, there are a lot of buts here. Let's review them. A lot of these kids, a majority of these kids had a hemolytic disease, mostly malaria. And a third of them had extremely severe anemia. We rarely see a child in our practice, and I think you can validate this, Peter, with a hemoglobin less than five. Yeah, very rarely, ever. And interestingly, in a subsequent analysis, it's also been shown that a lot of these kids had sickle cell as well. So there's a lot of reasons for hemolysis and, and severe anemia. And interestingly, there was a high rate of mortality in the severe anemia children who got fluids, but very low rate in the children without severe anemia who got fluids. And I'll address that again in a minute. They also had no access to ICUs, understandably. There, were no, there was no high flow nasal cannula, which we might place on any child in shock in our environments. Uh, there were no ventilators, there were no vasopressors, there were no invasive lines. And they had no objective measure of volume status, meaning were these kids really super dehydrated? And to be honest, in most US centers, we're not using an objective measure like an abdominal IVC ultrasound, which I advocate. Lots of controversy about that, but if a child has a fully collapsing IBC on a simple ultrasound, you know that they will tolerate intravascular volume delivery, period. If they're in shock, they need it. So that was not taken into account. Interestingly, also not highlighted in this study is that 45% received blood transfusions. And interestingly, in the no fluid bolus group, many more of those kids got blood than in the <laughs> bolus group. Unreal. Last two things, the control group had a low mortality. Remember uh, internationally, sepsis mortality is super high. It's like in the 40, 50% range, I believe. And so these were not a group of critically ill children with sepsis. They had other things. They had other reasons for their fever. And then perhaps most importantly, hypotensive patients, back to the graph that we showed a minute ago, were not randomized to no bolus. We would, we would both agree, we would probably all on this phone call agree that a child in shock with hypotension demands immediate volume resuscitation, and that was not performed. And so when we, when we look at the headline here, fluid bolses hurt children, it's scary. But then we have to consider that these were not a population of children in an environment that we manage, a population we see or an environment in which we manage patients in this country. And I don't believe that this study, other than with one caveat, that this study is uh, suitable data to, to change our practice on, or recommendations on the resuscitation of someone with shock or septic shock. The one caveat I would say is, did they get detailed bedside reevaluation of their response? And in particular, were they using ultrasound, which they weren't. So it, to the extent that we have better tools to monitor patient response to fluid boluses and have additional resources like oxygen, ICUs, and the things we have, I think this, this study taught us something, but I don't know that it is applicable to the PALS guidelines. And what I love, the joke I love to tell is that the fluid overload in, in our environment is not the ER doctor or the paramedic's fault. It's the ICU doctor's fault, almost always. And Peter, I think I see you nodding. I think you'll agree with that. My okay. God. Yeah, and you know what? I, um, go ahead. You no, know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I love this slide of yours because this says it all that you know, where is the fluid coming from? So yeah, please, please let us know in the ICU world, how does this happen? Yep. So uh, this patient, I don't have time to go into the details, but if you'll notice, this is a, right out of Epic. It's the ins and out chart, which I look at every day. And on this patient who had a ruptured appy in sepsis, she got resuscitated on the first day with five liters of fluid. This is an adolescent, probably reasonable. But then over the course of care, she just kept getting more and more and more and more and more 
vasopressors, fluid boluses, medicines, you name it, without someone paying attention that, wow, she's becoming eight liters positive by day four, and then she's needing oxygen, and then she uh, possibly has some consequences. This is our inattentiveness. It wasn't because of the poor initial shock resuscitation. And in that far right-hand bar, we do produce all the things that people talk about with volume overload, but a reasonable, rapidly delivered bolus of 20 to 40 per kilo for a child in shock is not going to produce these consequences. And we need to, I think, not scare people that, that that's going to happen. And I feel like the, the commentary that a fluid bolus is reasonable rather than recommended may make folks hesitant about that intervention, Peter. And lastly, I'll say the founder of this Society for Critical Care Medicine, William Shoemaker, has a funny quote, which is, ICUs give too much, too late, to too few. So we need to resuscitate early and then stop giving all that fluid in the ICU would be my bottom line comment and not be afraid so, to resuscitate in the field or in the ED. And I can tell you just from my own experience that when we give the fluids up front, the kids do remarkably better, remarkably, right in front all of our the, eyes. All the, all the data validate that, Peter, which right. we don't have time and to go into today. Right. And, and I know you can't talk about your, the, the life flow, but we use it at our hospital and we have seen right in front of our eyes, kids go from altered to awake and talking when you give fluids quickly with a reevaluation. So we always reevaluate after every bolus. And I think everyone listening to this, um, you know, understands that's how important that really is. Okay. So um, Mark, let, let's, let's kind of finish off fluids and, and, and just kind of reemphasize their recommendation for yep. fluids. In the green shock. one is awesome. The green number one is awesome. Reassess after every fluid bolus. A child in shock okay. needs active resuscitation at the bedside with every provider who's involved sticking at, with the patient at the bedside. Did they respond to that fluid bolus? Is their liver getting big? Do they have crackles, rouse, hypoxia, whatever? Watch for complications, but monitor their response with cap refill, mental status, heart rate, and blood pressure uh, vigorously and repetitively at the bedside and you will produce good outcomes. Um, crystalloids or colloids are both noted as effective. We rarely use colloids in our resuscitation. Probably balanced solutions are better, meaning lactated ringers or plasma light. There's a big ongoing randomized trial of that. I'm guessing it's gonna show benefit. If you have the opportunity in your uh, agency to use a balanced solution like LR, it's probably better than saline. Um, I would say that the, the potential harms of the hyperchloremic saline solutions are probably more likely to occur with large volumes over the ICU course than they are with their first boluses in the field. So it's not a, a essential to have, but I think it's a nice to have if you're able to use a balanced solution. And the volume 10 to 20 are just perfect uh, recommendations, 10 to 20 per kilo, up to probably a 50 kilo kid where you're going to give a 500 bolus and, and reassess is a very reasonable dose to give. And this is not on a pump. This is with a syringe or some other method rapidly given so you can detect the response and make the response happen quickly. Perfect. So I want to talk about uh, that real quick, because again, um, you know, we, we see it all the time that, um, and actually we were just doing some training uh, two days ago where we, were, we, we had a kid who needed 400 cc's of fluid and, you know, someone, you know, hooks up the IV and then they, they squeeze the bag. Um, we know that that's not appropriate especially if you're only a few minutes away from the hospital, you figure we're gonna let the hospital do that. Uh, don't don't uh, kind of fall into that trap because it doesn't happen. We in EMS should be coming to the hospital with kids in shock with fluids on board, push pull, reassess after each bolus. Now this push pull thing, again, uh, it, it's, not, it's not the best thing in the world, I mean, unless you have uh, you know, the life flow and which is bet much better. But in the meantime, let's just talk about, you could give more fluids if the reassessment suggests it. And again, that's what the guidelines will tell you. And again, here what Mark talked about, LR or plasma light, and we're looking forward to the results of that study. So um, I'm gonna start and then I know Mark, you have a couple of videos here because people hear push pull and they're like, well, um, we don't do that. Well, you probably don't do it because people have a lot of anxiety about doing it. I love telling someone to do push pull and then watching them and then they kind of look at me funny. But push pull requires a three-way stopcock. It requires, um, you know, one end go to the patient, one side goes to the IV bag, 
And then ultimately you'll find people pulling out this very large syringe thinking, hey, bigger syringe, I can fit more volume in it. But then they realize that trying to squeeze that through a 24 gauge catheter or even through an IO is hard to do. So uh, Mark, I know you have some videos on this. And uh, what people also need to understand is that syringes were never made to reuse. And when that person's hand is on the plunger and going in and out, um, I know there was a study done where they put some fluorescence on the provider's hand and within a few pumps, the entire inside of the syringe fluoresced. Syringes are not made to push pull. Um, and I know Mark, that's why you kind of went on that mission to make it better. But here's this, you wanna walk us through this? Yeah, just a septic shock, 10 year old, just intubated. We're trying to get volume into her. And the temptation is to use a 60 mil syringe and pushing through that to be IO is really, really hard. So if you instead put a 10 mil syringe or 20 mil syringe on, you can administer that volume a lot quicker. So this is better than a pressure bag or hanging by gravity or squeezing the bag. This is gonna get you your volume in in a meaningful amount of time, whatever type of access you have. And then you'll be able to actually assess, did that patient respond to that 20 minutes? And you can see here the, uh, the child's skin. It's very obvious here um, that this child is in need of, uh, of fluids. And it's interesting, you know, let's say this kid is, you know, five years old, 20 kilos, needs 400 cc's of fluid. How many of these syringes do you have to do and that back and forth of touching the syringe in and out yep. may not be the best thing in the world, but th this right here is really the most effective way, uh, you know, that, that most people know about unless you use uh, the life flow. So let's so, comment on the uh, placement of the IO, Peter. You noticed that we're using tibials. I've since moved all of my IO placements up to the femoral, which I know you have as well. And the reasons yes. for that are, you can obviously see it's a bigger bone. A big problem with IO use is that we often dislodge that um, IO in the jostling of the patient and moving them and pulling tension on the line um, that's attached to our fluid delivery device. And so as soon as the hole enlarges by motion of the needle, you're done, you, you're gonna infiltrate. So placing an, a distal femoral IO, I believe is a much more well seated device, it stays there, it stays in place much better and you have better flow directly into the femoral vein through a bigger bone marrow cavity than you do in the tibial. So I've, I've opted for this and I find that you get much better resuscitation for it. And I think Peter, you're recommending that now as well. Yeah, and ju ju just to give everyone a little idea, so let let's do this via Zoom. I know you can't see us, but take, take your hand and put it on your kneecap with your leg fully extended and then come up off the kneecap and you'll land into a, like a little divot right above your kneecap, right? Some people will say, go right there, right through the, the skin, but you, you're gonna go through the patellar tendon. What I say to do is go just medial. So just kind of a little bit, if you're on your right leg, go to the left of that. And then that's your spot. You can't miss, you're not near the growth plate. We, we've put out some videos you can look at on YouTube on the Hand Heavy Minute um, as to how to do this. But the Teleflex people agree with it. Um, and we've been doing it now for a couple of years with great success, but only do it in cardiac arrest because if the kid's awake, that needle, the plastic of the needle will burn the skin and you'll get a screaming kid and a very upset mother. So we do still use proximal tibia for the non-cardiac arrest kid, but for all cardiac arrest, it's femoral IO. We use a blue or a yellow, not the pink. And we've had great success. Yeah. Um, and so I, I would really recommend that to Peter, everybody. The blue or yellow is the key. There's a lot more soft tissue there to go through and you will not have enough purchase into the bone if you don't use a longer needle. As illustrated in that, in that uh, drawing there, you need one black line protruding as you hit the bone and then you'll have enough to get through the cortex, okay? The, others, the other one where you go all the way down to the bone and you don't see any more needle left, won't work. That's not good. Lastly, right. I always give lidocaine in any semi-awake patient into the marrow itself. Okay, you can give about a milligram per kilo of lidocaine and you'll diminish the uh, pain on injection if that's the only access you have. So don't forget that. Yeah, we, we, we have a half a milligram per kilo to a max of 40. Uh, oftentimes that's what we see in EMS protocols around the country. But yeah, that's, I completely agree with that. And we, see, we do see a lot of agencies who have that in their protocol. Awesome. All right, let's, let's move on because we want to get, get through uh, this entire uh, talk. Symptomatic bradycardia. Th this is one that, again, 
look at the data, read the paper, make your determination on what you want to do. And I'll, I'll kind of give you my opinion here at the same time. Uh, Matthias Holmberg, another great researcher, very smart uh, you know, team of, of researchers here. They asked the question, should we be giving cardiac arrest epi for kids who still have a pulse, bradycardia, which has been in the guidelines for many, many years. It's not an ACLS, right? The only epi in an ACLS is an infusion of epi. And so he asked the question. So let's take a look at the data. Now, I want to kind of make this maybe uh, confusing graph a little easier. This is a risk ratio uh, graphic here where I put a red line at the number one. So if anything, um, all of the dots on the left-hand side favor not giving epinephrine. So they didn't give epinephrine. Again, um, this, this, this study was propensity matched. It had almost 7,000 patients, not 47, but almost 7,000 patients. And you could see that the bottom number here, the overall that there was, and according to the, to the, uh, to the researchers here, that giving epi led to worse outcomes in children who were receiving CPR for bradycardia with poor perfusion. Um, I felt this for, for many years, and I was hoping in 2019 when I read this paper that the, the guidelines would finally move to this. Quite frankly, I moved to it in my agencies back when this paper came out, and I was convinced that they were gonna move to it here in this paper. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I'm gonna go back one. Unfortunately, they did not. So uh, just kind of a word to the wise, read the paper, think through it, and then this is the one protocol that we can now finally align with adults. So what do I do in my protocol? We have now, we've now moved to push presser epi, right? One to 100,000, if you still use that language, and we give one ML. If you're a year and uh, if you're a year and over, you get one ml. You're under a year, you get a little less than an ml. An, an ML. Very simple to do. Um, we've had great success with it, and I'm hoping now that the guidelines end up moving towards this in the future at some point. Last topic, Mark. Um, big kudos to you because we now have blood uh, in South Florida, in Broward County. Uh, it's on the helicopter, so kudos to Broward Sheriff's Office, uh, Dr. Jim Rose, Chief Heath Clark, they're, they're the miracle workers, but they got whole blood in. Talk to us about these guidelines and what they're recommending. Yeah, so um, obviously a bleeding patient needs blood. And so this is validated in the guidelines that when available, blood products are preferred over crystalloid resuscitation in a child. That doesn't mean a hypotensive trauma patient should not get crystalloid if they are hypotensive, if they're a child. That, that, that is a caveat I would give. They don't need lots of volume and probably the 20 mil per kilo range is as much as you wanna to give to a child prior to you getting the blood cooler delivered to the trauma room. But when possible, blood is best. It's, I think the data are not quite that there yet in children, Peter, on whole blood, but we know that whole blood is probably the, the blood product of choice in any trauma patient. And in fact, what you're using there in Broward, my own hospital now has whole blood. Um, because there are not as much pediatric data on it, we restrict, I believe, to 15 and over um, in our official guidelines on the use of whole blood in kids. But I believe the studies will be coming that validate whole blood for kids as well. And it makes intuitive sense because in a large transfusion of blood in a bleeding patient, we want to give equal ratios of plasma, pack cells, and platelets. And in reality, we have great difficulty doing that in any kind of reasonable ratio. And so whole blood yeah. is um, the fluid of choice because it contains all the products that we want to give. So fresh whole blood or pack cells in a ratio of 10, uh, ratio of one to one to one plasma platelets pack cells is ideal. We start with 10 per kilo of uh, blood in a child. That's up to about 30 kilos where your uh, pack red cell unit ends up being about 300 uh, mils. Um, the whole blood units, interestingly, are 500 mils. So one unit in a 50 kilo kid. Then plasma alone, if, we, if that's all we have, um, freeze-dried plasma is a therapy that's coming. I'm not sure when, but it will be here eventually. And then fluids, ideally a balanced resuscitation fluid um, for kids with trauma and hypotension when you don't have blood available. One little quick caveat that I think people forget is 
Ideally, we don't give LR, this is the one case where you don't want to use LR, we don't give LR and citrated blood products together because there can be some calcium precipitation. So lactated ring or as well, ideal for most resuscitation is not to be mixed with um, blood with anticoagulants in it. But I guess the, the lesson is, PALS is obviously recommending that blood is best to start our resuscitation in bleeding patients. I agree with that. Hopefully we'll have whole blood approved for kids in general uh, use uh, in the near future. Any more awesome. comments you have, Peter? No, that was, a, that was a great recap. And I think there's a lot of folks in the pre-hospital the, the pre arena will, will answer this question. That's yep. the beautiful part and of it. It's amazing how many agencies are now using pre-hospital whole blood. Yeah, uh, right. So Probably leading that, the way even over some trauma centers. Right. That's why I love EMS. And, you know, um, again, we had a patient recently that the helicopter landed. They used the whole blood. They used the life flow. They got the guy back to life. It was amazing. So I think that's going to be the future and EMS will solve that problem. So let's, let's wrap it up here so we have some time for some questions. But Hillary mentioned the article that she allowed me to write. It's a 2,500 word op-ed where um, I notified the folks at the uh, American Heart Association through Hillary. They were very kind to uh, actually write back, uh, which is very nice. And they actually wrote back. And so uh, Dr. Tapjayan um, from, uh, from uh, Philadelphia uh, wrote back. And it was very, you know, I think a very thoughtful response. So, um, and that was a month later. And then in February, EMS World was kind enough to actually print this in the, in the magazine. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Send it to Mark and I. Uh, again, if you think we're completely wrong, please let us know. We will not get upset with you, promise. Uh, we're in this together. We're, the reason we're put on this earth is to get more kids back to life, period, end of story. And if you think that, you know, we're way off or that we should be looking in another direction. We're happy to do so. I'll take any phone call, any email, uh, any text. So then that's what I would recommend that you do. Mark, any thoughts on that? No, other than it makes physiologic sense that if you're not paying any attention to when the CPR downstroke is, you're going to probably have an ineffective ventilation on that breath. And that air is going to go more likely into the stomach. So I think Asynchronous should not imply you're not paying attention to, to the CPR cycle. And I, I have a quick anecdote from my own experience, my own N of one of having to do CPR with mouth to mouth in the field on a drowning victim, which I had the, the unusual opportunity to do um, less than a year ago. And I've never done mouth to mouth before, but I realized, wow, it's hard <laughs> to get a good seal and deliver a breath to someone who's drowned. And if I had tried to breathe during the compressions of my partner, it wouldn't have been effective. So I had to time my breaths and she actually, in this case, stopped compressions. But I was struck with the importance of at least paying attention to the, the cycle of the CPR you're in when you're trying to give that breath. Um, thankfully that patient lived, um, wow. but I Great. learned a lot about CPR firsthand uh, in an unexpected event. And so my only, caution there is don't, it's not like the two are not working in some type of coordination when you, when you talk about the concept of asynchrony. Do you have any, any other comments, Peter? No, that's, that's great. Well said. Yep. Patrick, what do we yeah. got next? Yeah. Well, real, real quick. I have a few folks that are asking about uh, how to obtain CEs if they're using a phone to watch today, or if there's a link. Um, I would say that if you're on a phone today, um, and you wanted to use that QR code, I would say take a screenshot of it. And while it's not ideal, I would uh, borrow a partner's phone to hover over that QR code and, and fill that in afterwards. But uh, James, uh, or maybe Pete, if you have the answer to this, uh, will it be yeah. that, C, that QR code to be sent out? What we'll do is on the email that goes out tomorrow, we'll, we'll, we'll add a link into that. Perfect. Awesome. Not a problem. Everyone will be obtaining an email uh, tomorrow um, at about 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time tomorrow with that link. Um, the other question that came through, another question that came through was from Steve Suarez. Uh, with regard to innovation topic, now that video laryngoscopy is here, do you think that there is room to reevaluate this topic? And this was back uh, about halfway through the presentation today. Uh, I'm at a medium-sized agency with 100% video laryngoscopy on all units, and we closely monitor first-pass success rates. The more this topic is discussed, the more our paramedics and medical director feel we should be moving away from innovation of pediatrics. From what I'm seeing, this hasn't been well studied. Thoughts? It has not been well studied. And like I said before, it'll probably be a controversy um, until for the rest of our lives. I think in a high performance agency that's training on it and used to it, 
I think it's reasonable, it's reasonable to allow that into the scope of practice. Um, and there's an agency and even in our state who trains routinely with video laryngoscopy and has a high success rate and has, has grown their first pass success rate from I think 60 to over 90%. And so I, I think it uh, remains a matter of debate and uh, it should be managed on a agency by agency basis and where there's attention to training put in and people have comfort with that, with that skill and that device, I think it should be uh, potentially allowed. Do you, have, do you have an opinion, Peter? Yeah, I do. I think that if you have a, a small cadre of individuals who you can train up. So for example, at one of my agencies, I have 1500 paramedics, but I have a small cadre of EMS captains who we train them up on that. So I, I trust them with anything. We even do finger thoracostomy in the field. We have robust CQI. We have robust training. Um, so we are able to manage all of that and understand if, we're, if what we're doing is correct. And if it's not, then we change course. One other comment is I do believe that video allows you to do what we were talking about, which is not interrupt compressions during intubation. It's almost impossible to do it a DL that way. I think you can slip the scope in, suction the mouth, and probably place an airway quickly undergoing CPR to the extent you have video laryngoscopy. I don't have data on that. I, it's just my personal opinion. Um, Patrick, before we go to the next question, let me just also add one point because I know we didn't talk about it, which is neonatal resuscitation. You know, uh, we are, uh, we all agree that we should stick to three to one there. Um, and so just, just kind of make everyone aware that that's the case. Interestingly, there was a paper that just came out looking at CPR in the delivery room. And what they found was very interesting that almost all of the physicians there started chest compressions before they addressed the airway. And as we know, in neonatal resuscitation, it's airway, airway, airway. So even the experts in, in neonatal resuscitation uh, kind of lose track of, uh, of, of the prize, interestingly enough. So with that being said, Patrick, next question, if you have one. Yeah, I have uh, two more that uh, come to mind here. The first one uh, coming from Elizabeth uh, asking, could you please repeat your recommendations for epi and symptomatic bradycardia? And I'd also like to add on to that uh, question, Pete. Uh, I did have a conversation. He's not on today. He was un unable to join us, but from Dr. Mark Gamber from Plano Fire the other day yep. relating to uh, atropine use in bradycardia. Yeah, so, um, you know, listen, I think atropine use in specific types of bradycardia are great. I mean, obviously, if you have a third degree or something like that, it's not going to work. But if you have a child who's symptomatic bradycardia, they're more than likely hypotensive, they're bradycardic, and you're going to reach for that epi 1 to 10,000 cardiac arrest dose, what you're going to end up doing is increasing the SVR, you're going to increase the myocardial oxygen demand, that heart is going to go from beating very slowly to probably not beating at all, as was shown in the Holmberg paper. So here's what I would recommend. And again, we have videos, uh, you can look at our YouTube channel, and there's videos on that, but you take your cardiac arrest epi, you empty out 10, uh, 9 mLs. Yes, I know you're wasting it, but I'll tell you why I'm telling you that. You, you only have one ml left in your Brista jet. You take a three-way stopcock and you fill up nine mLs back of saline. You've just diluted your cardiac arrest epi by tenfold. So now it's not one to 10,000, it's one to 100,000. And every one ml has 10 micrograms. So we, in our protocol, we're happy to share our protocols with anybody. We, you just attach that, little, that new Brista jet that you created and you give one ml. And that one ml could last you 15 minutes. The heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, but instead of it being a shock to the system with a significant amount of epinephrine, you're almost giving, it's, it's very nice and gradual. And if it didn't work, you give another ml. Right. So it's an as needed every uh, you know, PRN Q one minute. I uh, hope that was a good explanation, I, but again. I, I second that Peter, and this is uh, not evidence-based, it's just my comment, but I like to say that everything Atropine does, Epi does better in almost every situation. There's almost not a role for it, I believe. And so the, 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 the push dose presser, minute dose, as you mentioned, is, is right to use in these situations. Perfect. It awesome. needs, Thanks for that. You need to train on how to mix it, how to draw it up and how to give it. I agree with that. But there's, in, in some hospital studies, there's been a lot of medication errors in the in the uh, delivery of push dose pressure. So be careful, but if you have a reference you can go to to mix your push dose, it works beautifully. 
And you know what? Um, I'm, I'm going to push the envelope here because this is what I think is the future. And we just started doing it here in Broward County. Again, kudos to Dr. Jim Roach and, and Broward Sheriff's Office. Intra-arrest epinephrine drip. So perhaps we should be moving away from the one milligram in the adult, one milligram, or the 0.01 per kilo in kids, which is spiking um, that, that pressure. It's, it's collapsing, the, it's constricting the vessels in the brain. Perhaps we should mix a drip, get that femoral IO in, start to drip, run it at one drop a second. Uh, if, if, if you have a hundred bag, that hundred bag goes in over 16 minutes. So you get two doses in over 16 minutes. That's one dose every eight minutes, but you don't have to fumble around with anything. So we are now moving towards that. Uh, Wake, Wake EMS has been doing this for 14 years, um, very successfully where they actually just put epi into a bag and they run it in. They do not do boluses of epi. That is the future of epinephrine. And I think uh, that's what we're gonna push for and do the research on. Peter, one of my favorite topics, can I take the question, what is your recommendation, re recommended age range for the distal femur IO? Go ahead. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> zero to 80 years old. Um, and it's not an FDA approved indication, I think, for the easy IO device to use it outside of kids. I don't know if you know any more info on that, Peter, but yeah, I do. I have a lot of adult sized kids, and I'm not sure why we wouldn't just use it in everyone, to be totally honest. So, so you, you're, you're correct in that the FDA does not say you could, but I will tell you that there are agencies that I know very, very well that have, they loved it so much in kids that they moved to all in adults. There are agencies who love it so much in adults that when the, when, when the person's, you know, muscle thickness and soft tissue is so thick, they take a scalpel, they cut the skin open, and then they drill right through. I'm not advocating that, but it sounds interesting. Yeah. Right. But just, just to tell you that um, it, it, it is possible to do, talk to your medical director, make sure you're not doing things that are out of scope of your practice, but there are people in the country doing it, but for sure, do it for children. Someone just put a comment in that said womb to tomb. I guess that <laughs> How about cradle to grave? I like that. All right, womb to tomb. I like that. All right. So um, speaking of womb, people have been sitting in the same womb for about 90 minutes. Uh, Patrick, you want to, uh, is there one, are there any last questions or? One last one. One last one I had in mind here. Uh, and I think you covered it briefly and it should be a pretty quick answer, but it comes from David Lacobi. Uh, with the introduction of supervised uh, airways, should we even consider the utilization of endotracheal innovation in the field? Regardless of the system, pediatric endotracheal innovation is a very low frequency event. We have seen a very positive ventilation with supraglottic airways. Almost all endotracheal innovations done outside of the hospital, uh, there are problems with the tube, uh, parentheses small or deep. So first of all, I love Dave McCovey. Uh, I trained, when I trained in Pittsburgh as a fellow, um, you know, Dave, Dave was there and I learned so much from him and, um, I ran into him at an airport in Fort Lauderdale anyway. So, <laughs> so Dave, so the, the answer is that that's what we do now. We go super glottic all the way. We, we will then upgrade if we need to. So drowning patient needs higher pressures like Mark alluded to. We had two children, an eight or 10 year old in a fire, soot coming out of the airway. Their airways were closing down. We, we do DSI, we DSI them. Um, and we, we, we tube them. So the, the, the answer is yes. The frequency is very low. As an example, just let me give you some numbers. If you live in a community of 100,000 people, you would expect 100 patients to go into cardiac arrest, of which you'll work 50 of them. That's just kind of random number, like average numbers across the country. So my agency where we have 100,000 people, we have 170 personnel, we do about 50 to 55 arrests. Dave's right, even in adults, it's a low frequency thing. So that's why we do now two big breaths, eye gel on everybody, cradle to grave, womb to tomb, and then we will upgrade as needed. But I, I will not remove the endotracheal tube because those two children in Palm Beach County would have died if I would have done that. So Mark, what are your thoughts? Sorry, remind me the question again. Um, Whether or not we should just go right to supraglottic because and, and use supraglottic principles. Yeah, I think it's yeah. hard for me to say no to that. I think I think it's very effective. Um, I think our county agency uses uh, Kings, which seem to be equally as effective. 
I, I have a bias towards intubation in the right agency with the right training, with the right equipment. So I'm not going to say it should never be done, but I think either are with the right training, either are probably acceptable, at, but, but the most realistic approach is the superglottic. Right. You know, and, uh, it, what I was going to say, Patrick, yeah. if, if people want to drop off, they can, I mean, uh, Mark, can you stick around and see if yeah, yeah. still raising yeah. their hand? Okay. Um, There's so many IO questions. I'm just itching to answer, but I'll, I'll let you guys drive the questions. No, no, no. Yeah. Doc, if you see a question about IO, please bring it up. But I, I do want to ask one follow-up to that uh, superglottic then. What would you say to the docs and the ED who ripped out that mm. superglottic once that patient <laughs> arrives and, <laughs> and have trouble managing that, that ET? I'd say so, if you have a good chest rise and you have a good internal waveform, stick with it until you are more stabilized. Um, and, and have the medical director walk into the emergency department, gather everyone, you know, set up a meeting, bring in the eye gel and say, this is what we use. This works. Stop ripping this thing out. Yep. Focus on chest compressions. And because what they do, you're right, Patrick, they pull it out. Everybody flocks to the airway. And now chest compressions are not doing well. They're not giving the meds they need to do. They're not getting the x-ray or they're not getting the blood gas, whatever it happens to be. It does take collaboration and letting the, the hospital know what you're doing. So for example, I just started antibiotics for sepsis pre-hospital. Well, if I wouldn't have told them what I'm doing, I would have pissed off a lot of doctors as well in the hospital. But we've been doing that now for two years in Palm Beach County with, with great success. So it's all about the collaboration. That's how I would finish that. Doctor, your favorite question. Easy IO question if you saw one. Yeah. Our friend um, Joseph Zalkin asked, any experience with the other IO device? My answer is no. Um, I have a bias on the device. I probably shouldn't push any certain product, but uh, something that has a motor and works like a drill and is fast and it's precise works brilliantly. And I, I, don't, I haven't experienced any other device. Someone did though ask a question about the Jamshidi, meaning the manual insertion of the IO needle like we used to do back when Peter and I were residents. And it's so difficult and imprecise and risks making the hole bigger. And the, yeah. you can put it through the tibia, all the way through the tibial bone to the other side in a child. I think that the drill gives you a much more precision feel, a cleaner hole and a better ultimate uh, resuscitation in the child. So I, I'm, I'm with using a, a mechanical drill whenever possible. And then lastly, humerus versus femur. I think humerus is great. It has better flow. It tends, I think, to get in the way of the resuscitation and is more easily dislodged. And I find in younger children, it's hard to find. So um, I'm still biased. Unless you have uh, extremity or pelvic or abdominal trauma, I think the femoral approach is a good one. Peter? Yeah. So I, I have a couple comments on that. So yes, we use the EZIO. We recently, someone just came into our hospital system and I don't know what happened there, but they gave us another brand of something else. And it, it literally was shot out and almost hit somebody in the eye because it's like a spring-loaded device. Um, and so we, we don't, I mean, I would never recommend that. But, uh, and the Jam Sheedy, again, if, if you were on a desert island and that's all you had, you would use Great. that. You, yeah. but, but, but you live in America and you probably shouldn't use it anymore. <laughs> and oh, and as far as, uh, as, far as the, the, uh, the, the femur versus the humerus, in children under the age of 10, their humerus still has a lot of cartilage in it. So that's why I would say to you that the humerus can be used, proximal humerus, uh, in the older child. After the age of 10, you can give it a try, but my preference would still be like Mark, the, the, the distal femur. We've created a short five minute video on our uh, YouTube channel. Please go take a look and you'll see the data uh, is really uh, remarkable there. Let's keep okay. going, Pat. Perfect. Um, I did see a few folks that were having some trouble entering their uh, uh, license uh, expiration date in the uh, QR code. Uh, if you're having trouble with that, again, a uh, link will be going out tomorrow. We'll make sure to rectify that, um, that field on our side to make sure that it's working appropriately. Um, so uh, stand by for that. But I know that you'll like this question here, Pete, uh, having to deal with eye gels for pediatric. This comes from Tyler Phelan. We do not have eye gel for pediatrics. From what I understand, you still recommend continuous compressions with BVM ventilation. Is that correct? After recess and ROS, continue with BVM or innovate since we do not have eye gel? Well, listen, I think that, you know, the skill of the BVM, like Mark said, is, is, is a skill that, you know, if you, have a, if you have a kid who, let's say, is not a drowning, 
and you're able to manage the secretions and you're able to manage anything coming up and you maybe even elevate the kid a little bit. Uh, but if, if you have, I'm being honest, if you have a kid who's got uh, a lung full of fluid and not only is the stomach emptying out from the pool water, but he's got pulmonary edema squirting out this the foamy, kind of the foamy uh, pink frothy stuff coming out at you, um, you're going to have a hard time and you're going to have to know how to suction. You're going to have to know how to manage that airway appropriately. But um, I think, listen, I think there are certain situations where uh, uh, having an advanced airway is beneficial. And if you can do that, I would do that. But again, you have to measure it versus what is the cost of, the, not the, the, the actual monetary cost, but the cost of training to the number of patients you're going to see. And so there's, there's a lot of variables that get in there. Are you able to get into the OR and work with the anesthesiologist? Um, so I will say to you that be an expert at BVM, be an expert at BVM and suctioning the airway using OPA, MPA, jaw thrusts, and so forth. Um, but if you had the ability in certain situations, drownings, fires, anaphylaxis, and so forth, you're going to need to intubate. Uh, but again, you're going to have to take uh, a look at those numbers at your own agency in your community. And I'm happy to talk offline. Mark, any other comments on that? Peter, one, one pearl I probably should include in our BVM slides is, the, is what you mentioned, the OPA. So if, you're gonna, if you are going to be in that category that you have to provide BVM the whole way in, and that's your airway, uh, you need an oral, oral airway in place. It's gonna, it's gonna make the yes the resuscitation the the BVM ma the masking much easier and more effective. So don't forget that. I, NPAs and kids I don't think are super effective because their their nostrils are already so tiny. So put an oral, oral airway in. Yeah, yeah, Patrick. I um I actually made that that field not required. So if they refresh their screen, let's see if it works. If not, please let us know and we'll fix that for tomorrow. Sorry about that. And, uh, um, and Mark, do you guys have another five minutes? I know that you guys have busy days. Um, yeah, I got to head yeah. here to the hospital in a minute. So yeah, one okay, or two Last more. question then. Let's do the last one. This one comes from Michael Gardner. Uh, regarding stay on scene and working cardiac arrest with the goal of restart the heart before we depart, is there a recommended time frame when time, when, when is, is there a recommended time frame to move regardless of achieving ROS? Example, mm -hmm. 20 minutes, assuming high quality CPR, airway, IVIO, meds are all on board. I got a lot of questions about this in the field. Peter, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll give you my. I'll give you my opinion. And we, we just went through it at my agency in Coral Springs. The one thing as a medical director that I will never do is tell anyone you must do this X, Y, or Z number of minutes. What I do is I'll give you the tools to know the dose before you get there. When we get there, it's high performance CPR, the triangle of trust, position one, two, and three that never gets broken. We look the mom and dad in the eyes and we say, "This is why we're not leaving," because that's what they want to know. Why aren't you leaving? Someone explains to the mom or dad what we're doing. And then we train on getting three, do three doses of epi ready. So we take that epi out of the box. We put the Bristol jet together. We then take it apart. And we, there's a video what we have on this. We, we make three syringes, let's say two mLs, two mLs, two mLs for a five-year-old. We put those three syringes back in the epi box. First dose goes in. If that person somehow is rotating around, and I come and I see two doses left, I know that we're on dose number two. As soon as dose number three is given, that is my marker for saying, check, great. High performance CPR with great BLS care and three doses of epi with airway managed with an eye gel. And then, in, and then if you get ROSC, do a post-ROSC assessment, that is it. If one of my teams leaves after one dose of epi, I don't get upset, I don't get upset. But I'll go back with them and I'll review and I'll say, what was it that made you leave after one dose? And slowly but surely, when you start to get more kids back and more ROSC, it automatically takes care of itself. But just to answer your question, I don't have a 20 or 30 minute marker. I have a three dose of epi rule. Mark, you have any comments on that? No, I agree with that. I think you're, you're the expert on that one, Peter. I think... Um... That sounds like a reasonable approach. And, and, and there are other things that you may not be able to diagnose in the field that you need more higher level diagnostics to, to get ROS potentially. And, and, and who knows if that child is going to survive if you have to wait to get to the hospital to get them. But could they have tamponade or PE or pneumothorax or something else? So I think it's, I think it's worth, I think your rule is a good one. And then get there and, and add in other diagnostics and therapies. I like it. 
Awesome. awesome. Well, uh, thank you everyone uh, for your time today. I know that there are still a lot of questions out there. If you do have a question that's pressing that you do want to get some clarity to, please feel free to email either myself, Peter, or Mark. We'll be happy to answer those. And uh, Mark, you're the man. You're great. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Thanks for the invite. Thanks everyone oh, for awesome. organizing. Spread the word and let us know if there's any way we can help. Please reach out to us. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. All right, it. thanks. All right, have a good shift, Mark. Bye-bye.